go to the Lord together in prayer as we prepare for a time in God's Word from the book of Ecclesiastes. Father, we need you, and that is why we have gathered here today. Lord, our need is great, but your grace is greater. And so, Lord, we pray that in your grace now, your spirit, God will speak to us. God will confront us, will guide us in truth. Lord, will lead us into life. That, God, we may live indeed for you. Lord, this is our desire. We bring it to you now in Jesus' name. Amen. A number of years ago when I was pastoring a church in Indiana, I was teaching or preaching, I don't remember exactly the context, from Romans. And we were covering the, the, in Romans uh, an extended discussion about the pervasive problem of sin. So I had an idea and I asked one of my church members, I said, hey, would you do me a favor? Would you join me one day and let's go up to Indiana University campus and let's, let's do some man-on-the-street interviews and, and ask people a question. I'm curious whether or not people sort of believe the message of Romans. Now, we, we didn't tell anybody we were Christians or from a church or anything like that. We just, this fellow and I went, he filmed it. We just went around to people and said, hey, look, we're doing a little bit of research. Wondered if we could ask you a question for, for our research. And then the people said, yeah. So we asked probably about 20 people this question. We said, do you believe that people are basically good or bad? And overwhelmingly, all but one guy, everybody we asked said very quickly, oh, I believe people are basically good. And so we said, all right, the second question then is why? Why do you believe that? And what was an easy first answer, yes, I believe they're good, became more difficult. People said, well, uh, they would say things like, well, uh, it seems to me like most people, they'll try to help somebody if they can or something, or... You know, I haven't ever killed anybody or done anything really terrible. Sometimes they would kind of turn to themselves and look at their lives. They would say, uh, I feel like I, I do more good than bad, so I guess I would say I'm basically good. Well, it was, I appreciated the optimism that we encountered with all these people saying, I think people are basically good, people are good, people are good. But there was something not convincing about their explanations of why they believe that. Lastly, we, we asked this one guy, and it really was toward the end of the day. We stopped him and asked if we could ask him a question. He said, sure. We said, do you believe people are basically good or bad? He said, well, he said, oh, I, I like to try to give people the benefit of the doubt. But, man, people do a lot of shady stuff to each other. <laughs> that was his response. And not to be a downer today, but there was something about his answer that rang more true to me than all of the more optimistic answers of, well, I do more good than bad or something like that. I don't know. What do you think about that question hypothetically? you think people are basically good deep down or flawed or, or sinful? Well, as we study Ecclesiastes, and we're back to Ecclesiastes today in chapter 7, as we continue to look at the search for meaning and understanding of life, Today, we are going to be challenged to do something we don't always like to do, and that is to face reality. Let's be honest. Sometimes it is much more appealing to, to, to not deal with reality, isn't it? Sometimes it's more appealing to be optimistic, to think things are better than they really are, to think we're better maybe than we really are. But here's the problem. If, as long as we do that, we will not emerge as people that truly understand God because God deals in reality. We're going to find this today in Ecclesiastes. We're going to read today a passage from Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verses 15 to 29. If you have a Bible and want to read along or on your phone or something, feel free to pull that up, Ecclesiastes 7. Again, our passage is verse 15 through the end of the chapter. And I invite you to listen because this is God's Word. In my vain life, I have seen everything. There is a righteous man who perishes in his righteousness. And there is a wicked man who prolongs his life in his evil doing. Be not overly righteous and do not make yourself too wise. Why would you destroy yourself? Be not overly wicked, neither be a fool. Why would you die before your time? 
It is good that you should take hold of this, and from that withhold not your hand. For the one who fears God shall come out from both of them. Wisdom gives strength to the wise man more than ten rulers who are in a city. Surely there is not a righteous man on earth who does good and never sins. Do not take to heart all of the things that people say, lest you hear your servant cursing you. Your heart knows how many times you have yourself cursed others. All of this I have tested by wisdom. I said, I will be wise, but it was far from me. That which has been is far off and deep, very deep. Who can find it out? I turned my heart to know and to search out and to seek wisdom and the scheme of things and to know the wickedness of folly and the foolishness that is madness. And I find something more bitter than death. The woman whose heart is snares and nets and whose hands are fetters. He who pleases God escapes her, but the sinner is taken by her. Behold, this is what I found says the preacher, while adding one thing to another to find out the scheme of things, which my soul has sought repeatedly, but I have not found. One man among a thousand I found, but a woman among all of these I have not found. See, this alone I found, that God made man upright, but they have sought out many schemes." May the Lord bless our reading and hearing of what is kind of a confusing passage. This is one of those that that you have to wrestle with to try to get to the meaning of it. And today I hope I can maybe get to one meaning of it, uh, something we can take. This passage begins with the preacher. I'll remind you that tradition holds that that, that Solomon wrote this. And I'm going to advocate today that 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 might make sense of this passage. But the preacher says, in my vain life, I've seen it all. I've seen everything. It's kind of like he's telling us, reminding us, look, I'm going to tell you the truth. I'm not going to sugarcoat things. And what I'm going to tell you isn't always going to be pretty. One of the things he reveals today that, that, that grieves him so is he says, I've seen a righteous man that perishes in his righteousness, while I see wicked men prolong their lives as they practice evil. I thought about this passage as I remembered years ago when I was attending a church in Florida. Uh, There was a young man who'd grown up in this church. Uh, He was a member of the youth group. He graduated high school and was in college for pre-med. He was going into med school. He was brilliant, extremely smart, the kindest kid you had ever met, and he loved the Lord. In fact, his family said that that on his application for med school, and it was not at a Christian university, He wrote there these words, to me the most important aspect of my life, remember this is a teenager writing this, is my relationship with Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. When I die, I want to be known as someone who tried to follow God in everything. That was the heart of this young man. Well, one day we got the news that this young man was killed in a car accident. And I know from talking to his family and people in our church that one of the struggles was the question, Lord, why him? He was a good kid. Or why him? He loved Jesus. Why him? He was bold about his faith. He shared that he was a Christian. He wanted to tell people that. There's never a a good death, don't get me wrong. But sometimes when we see the righteous perish, we wonder why, Lord, Why not someone maybe who was a little more wicked coming to that kind of an end? Well, the preacher grieves this seemingly unfair success of the wicked while he sees the righteous perish. And so he says, well, then then don't be overly righteous. Don't try to make yourself too wise. For why would you want to destroy yourself? Now, I don't know about you, This is one of those things we read it and say, wait a minute, did the Bible really just say don't try to be too righteous or don't try to be too wise? Now, how many of you today, you want to say, all right, this is going to be my life verse. 
From now on, I'm going to live by this truth. Now, don't, I won't ever try to be too righteous, and I don't want to be too wise because God's word commands that. This is a strange thing. And it goes on. He says, and don't aim to be overly wicked. Now, wait a minute. Does that mean I can be kind of wicked? Again, is this a verse I can claim and say God's word says not to be overly wicked, so I'm just going to be moderately wicked my whole life so I can be a good Christian? I don't think so. I think to understand this, what we have to do is dig a little deeper down into verse 18, where he said, here's the, the good thing you need to do. Take this truth in this hand, and he says, and don't withhold this truth from this hand. In other words, take a hold of both of these realities. And he says, when you do that, then the one that fears God will emerge from both of those. Now, I don't know about you, what this says to me is that the preacher is saying, you've got to deal with reality to gain wisdom and understanding. You can't just grab a hold of one thing and think that's the answer to all of life. You have to look at everything. Eugene Peterson paraphrases it this way, and I think he does it really well. He says, it's best to stay in touch with both sides of an issue. The person who fears God deals responsibly with all of reality and not just one piece. The problem is sometimes dealing with reality is difficult. But the preacher says you've got to face reality if you want to emerge as one that really fears the Lord. It, this kind of reminds me of a strange example, but from current events, how many of you have seen in the news the rapper Ice Cube over the last week or so? So Ice Cube, who is black, he created something he calls the Contract with Black America, and it's his attempt to try to advocate for change in racial inequalities that he sees in the United States. And what happened is uh, Ice Cube said that he presented his contract for black America. He wanted to have a voice with, with both Democrats and Republicans, and he said what happened is Trump and Republicans responded and wanted to hear what I had to say. He said, the Democrats told me, well, we're interested, but we'll talk about it after the election. So he said, so I, I'm talking with them, and he came under tremendous flack by people that said, Ice Cube, you shouldn't deal with the Republicans on this or Trump because they are not your allies. You should deal with the Democratic Party. I'm not, this is not a political thing. What this is is, to me, an example of wisdom. And what Ice Cube did is he says this. He said, black progress is a bipartisan issue. When we created the contract with Black America, we accepted that we would talk to both sides of the aisle. Talking truth to whoever is in power is part of the process. I don't know about you, it sounds to me like Ice Cube is trying to be wise and deal with reality. And he's saying it's not helpful for you to try to push this to one side or the other. You got to take one in one hand, one in the other, and press forward and deal with things as they really are if you want to see progress. Well, seems to me like Ice Cube was a good example of ecclesiastical wisdom this week. The preacher goes on to remind us of the tremendous value of wisdom. So if you want to claim that verse that says, don't be too wise, well, take it easy, because the, the preacher says, wisdom gives strength to the wise man greater than ten rulers in a city. This is a reminder to, of, to us, we are better off with one wise ruler than ten who are powerful but foolish. Would you trade ten bad ones for one wise leader, one wise ruler? I would. Gives us a little perspective on that, don't make yourself too wise. Because I think what the preacher is really trying to say is, wisdom is tremendous as long as you deal with reality from every side. Now, here's the problem. There is a lot today of information that is, is proclaimed as wisdom that is not based in reality, isn't there? A lot of what is espoused as wise thinking and understanding isn't based in reality at all. Let me give you an example. You could go to any public university in, in any state, and you could study something like gender theory, where the wise people, training people in wisdom, will say there is no such thing as gender. Gender is a spectrum and it is fluid. Well, is that reality? Uh, I've got a, a good friend whose wife is a pathologist, 
She's a doctor who doesn't work with patients directly. She works with their, their samples of tissues and things. And she said one of the interesting things that has started happening in the last few years is we will be doing pathological work on someone's tissue and we will look at the paperwork and it will say that the patient is male, but she says the DNA test says they're female. Which is real? What's reality? The, the current wisdom will say there is no male or female. The scripture says God created us male and female in his image. And there's a DNA test that will prove that. And that used to be accepted as the truth. Not anymore. I say this as one example of the many ways we can start trying to be wise and forget reality altogether. Well, how did we get to that place? How do we get to that place where we, we think ourselves wise? We want to be wise, but we don't deal in reality. Well, it might have something to do with verse 20 where the preacher says this, Surely there is not a righteous man on earth who does good and never sins. What is the problem? Sin. That's the problem. And this is where becoming a realist, someone that deals in reality, becomes personal and kind of painful, isn't it? It is much easier for me to want to point to the world or someone else and say, they're sinful. But... The preacher says, there's not one righteous man on earth. That includes Eric, who does good and does not sin. The preacher kind of gives us a humorous lesson, I think, on the, the pervasiveness of sin, even in our own lives, when he says this. Let me give you some advice. Don't pay too much attention to what other people say, because if you do worry too much about what other people say, you might hear them saying something bad about you. He says, you won't like it, but do this. Remember in your heart how many times you've done the same thing to someone else. Isn't that a reminder that all of us have sinned? There is not one man or woman who always does what is good and does not sin. That isn't reality. and We've got to accept the reality. Verse 23, he said, I, I said to myself, I will become wise. But it was far from me. He can't do it. Well, why not? I think it's because he realizes the reality is he himself is sinful and that clouds his own understanding. I think we see this in verses 25 to 28. Now, this is a this is controversial little section of, of Ecclesiastes 7. The last few weeks, I had a couple of people reach out jokingly and said, I, I'm looking forward to you preaching Ecclesiastes chapter 7 at the end there where the writer says that he found one man out of a thousand that's wise, but no women. What are you going to do with that, preacher? Well, uh, I, I want to deal with that. This, this takes us back to, number one, my feeling that Solomon is probably the, the writer of this book. He never says so, but the evidence there that he was a king and he was really wise and all of these things. Um, so I, I don't think this is so much an indictment of women as unwise, as it is a confession of Solomon that he is unrighteous. Let me ask you this Bible trivia. How many of you know, what was Solomon's downfall? Women. Yes. You read, if you go to 1 Kings 11, you'll read this. Now King Solomon loved many foreign women from the nations, concerning which the Lord had said to the people of Israel, you shall not enter into marriage with them for surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. We read on and it says, Solomon had 700 wives who were princesses and 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart after other gods. I believe in this passage when the writer says, maybe I could find one wise man out of a thousand but I couldn't even find one wise woman out of a thousand. I think what he is doing is more confessing his own sin than he is complaining that there is no one wise out there. How many did he say wives and concubines he had? 700 plus 300, how many? A thousand. So maybe one man out of a thousand, but not one woman among all of these did he find that was wise. I believe what we read there is Solomon confessing his own weakness. And that is why he identifies how grievous and painful and worse than death the, the temptation of the woman whose heart would be a snare for him. He is confessing his own sin 
the reality of it. And imagine that. God says, I, I command you, do not marry. And how many did he marry? 700 wives and 300 concubines. He blew it in a big way. That was reality for him. And it takes me back to what that IU student said. You know, you want to give people the benefit of the doubt. Solomon was the wisest man that ever lived before Jesus came, right? You want to give people the, the, the benefit of the doubt, but ultimately everybody does a lot of shady stuff. Well, this is the bad news, brothers and sisters. If you want to emerge as someone that is wise who fears the Lord, you have to face reality. You have to face the harsh, bitter reality of the world around us, the sin around us, but also the sin within us, if you're going to do it. If you will do that, the good news is this. You will not emerge as someone who says, as, as the, the preacher did, vanity, vanity, everything is vanity. What will happen is, because we've heard the message of Jesus, if we will face the hard, painful reality of our sin, it will drive us to the gospel the good news. What is the gospel? I had an interesting talk. My mother is a member of a Presbyterian church, PCUSA church, and theologically they're, in her opinion, struggling right now. She said, Eric, most of the time in, in sermons I never hear anything about sin. It's just about love. And we talked and said, you know, we, we think sometimes people mistake that the gospel is the message to love one another. That isn't the gospel. That is the ethic of a saved, redeemed person who believes in Christ and who is made new. The gospel, according to Paul, he says, I remind you, brothers, of the gospel, the good news that I preach, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved if you hold fast to the word I preached for you. This is the good news that helps us to deal with the reality of sin, that Christ died for our sins. That's the gospel. That Christ was buried and that he was raised on the third day. See, the bad news is this. The reality is all of us have sinned and fallen short. And all of us have become clouded in our search for meaning and understanding and purpose as long as we remain in that sin. But the good news of the gospel is Christ died for our sins. He died that our sins could be forgiven. He died that our sins could be washed away. That the power of sin over us could be broken and we could become truly wise through the spirit that he implants within us. All of us, like the preacher, have gone astray. There is not one who does what is good and does not sin. But God, in his great mercy, sent Christ and the reality of our sin is no more evident than when we look to the cross where Jesus suffered for us and died. I believe this is the meaning and the purpose that Solomon wanted so desperately to understand, but it had not yet been revealed to him. But to us today, it has been revealed clearly. My question for you today is this. Have you faced the reality that you are a sinner? And have you then accepted the good news of the reality that Christ died for your sins if you will turn, repent, and believe in Him? Let us pray that God will help us to live in that reality. Father, we thank you today that amidst the bad news of Ecclesiastes, that it is all vanity, vanity, and there is not one that is righteous, no, not one. Everyone sins, and it is a wicked and desperate world in which we live. And we are the problem, as the writer wrote in verse 29, God made man upright, but it is our scheming that has ruined it all. Father, I thank you today that in the harsh face of this awful reality of our sin comes the good news of the gospel. That God, you so loved us, even in our sin, that you sent your only Son, that Christ died for our sins, that he was buried for us, and then that he was raised so that we too might be raised to live new life 
in the power of Jesus. Father, I pray today we will confess our sin and together we say, Lord, I have sinned against you. I, like Solomon, Lord, am wicked. God, I do not deserve your grace, but thank you for sending Jesus. I turn from my sin today, and I believe in Jesus that he died for me to forgive my sins, that he took my sin upon himself, that he was buried for me but was raised so that I too may have new life. God, I pray that each of us would live in that reality now and forever. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.